All right, guys, welcome back to the Coast Forge Football Podcast. My name is Lockie, and I'm joined today by two fellow fans, two familiar faces if you've been uh, checking out the podcast episodes. We've got Cam, we've got Dean. Guys, thanks so much for featuring on the podcast this week and so much to talk about from this week. And uh, us being Mariners fans, of course, fantastic to, to be uh, finally, finally, it feels like forever, celebrating a such a Coast Mariners win. Um, but there's some big results on the weekend, including a, a, a Sydney derby. We had Perth Glory back in action uh, at home for the first time in a long time. Um, so we're going to be breaking through some of the big stories from this past weekend in the A-League Men's competition. But of course, we have to start with the Mariners winning 2-1 over Brisbane Raw. And, and I would love just to ask you guys initially, I mean, what were your thoughts and, and feelings uh, from the performance? I mean, finally to get the win, Cam, if you want to start with you, what was your take on the game? I thought Monty was pretty spot on with his post-match conference um, saying Brisbane, they were a bit defensive to start with and we just found it hard to break them down. But I thought Brisbane had probably a 10, 15 minute period in the first half where they tend, they started to get on top of us. Um, and, you know, they hit the post and they caused us a little bit of problems, but thankfully they couldn't get the end result. Um, and then, yeah, second half, I thought we came out with a little bit more intent. Um, you know, Benny and Kololo does it again, three and three um, after, you know, the start of the season that he had, which is great for him. And then Mula, I mean, wasn't obviously meaning to hit the def- the wall and to go in the bottom corner, but it ended up in the bottom corner. Look good in the from the grandstand. So <laughs> I thought it just went straight in. I was like, "What a free kick!" Me too. Yeah, didn't quite pan out that way, but um, yeah. Look, I, I thought then after that, it was you could tell that they'd obviously had a lengthy discussion about how to close out a game because mm. as soon as Brisbane got two one, we wasted as much time as we could. We parked the bus. We just tried everything possible to hold on. And even then it nearly didn't pay off because Brisbane had a couple of chances towards the end, a few late scares, but yeah, a crucial three points if we do want to continue on and try and reach the top six. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and it was getting so nervy at the end, dude. I mean, I just, I, this, I'm just i scarred from previous weeks. It's, it's just holding and on Br- for that three points was all that mattered. Um, and, and Dean, I know we were talking about off air just before that, that this, and, and I agree with you, you said it wasn't necessarily like the prettiest performance. And I mean, for me, I mean, compared to recent weeks, it wasn't necessarily one of our best performances. There's even some games where we lost, where I thought we played better in compared to this one. In this game, I think we only had seven shots. I think last week away to Adelaide, we had 19 shots. So it was, it was a little bit different, but, but Dean, what was your take on this one? Um, the first 20 minutes was very cagey, I thought. I thought both teams were playing the the waiting game to see who was going to break first. Um, but then we got on, to, on top, I reckon, yeah, after the after they hit the post, I thought that's when we kind of mm. regathered ourselves and got control of the game a little bit. And then, yeah, as Cam said, the first 15, 20 minutes after half time, you know, we just come out, put the foot down and got those two goals. And then I thought the game changed when Nick Olsen and the the – Striker, I'm not sure of his name. Oh, Juan Lascano came on, yeah. Yeah, when those two come on and Nick Olsen started dropping in between the lines of the yeah, fullbacks and midfields, I think that changed the game for them. And I think that goal was coming for at least five, ten minutes. We just sat back, build and wait for it. And they finally got it. We had those few scares and scrapped the, scrapped the three points, really. So ugly three points, but it's the three points needed. Oh, absolutely. And considering, I mean, had we have lost this game, we would have gone bottom of the bottom of the ladder. So it was an important win for the Mariners. And and again, we, I mean, we've touched on Benny and Kalolo just briefly there, but he's been fantastic these last three weeks. And and the thing that stands out for me with Benny and Kalolo is just confidence. I mean, earlier on the season, like round one, he looked okay against the Jets and then picked up an injury in and out. And, and he just looked quite clumsy, clumsy at times and, and, and when he was on the ball and stuff. And He's finally getting some regular game time and and now three goals in three games. I mean, let's talk about like play performances, individual play performances. I mean, we, we, we talk about Jason Cummings as well. Um, Cam, if we want to start off with you, I mean, like, has Benny been the star for the Mariners? Who else has been impressing you in recent weeks? Yeah, well, Benny's an obvious one who stands out. Three goals in three games. It's hard to go past him. Um, and I think I wrote him off last time I was on the podcast. I, I didn't rate his... Me too. I said his work rate wasn't good enough and we're probably better off trying to fit Muller and Goddard and Nisbet into that team. And we've managed to, or all of them, but, but Goddard. Um, and Maresh is another example who we've just got so much depth. Um, in terms of who else impressed, I thought um, I thought our defence was mostly pretty solid. Ruan still looked a little bit 
disinterested and off the pace for mine. Um, I think their goal, he just completely lost the man over his shoulder and, you know, he hasn't played football in a while, but, you know, they're the sorts of things, you know, the mentality of football, it needs to be switched on, especially if you're still not 100% up to scratch. Um, but I thought Bazanic controlled the game quite well from the midfield um, and Marco Urania celebrating his birthday as mm. well. Uh, I thought he did quite well and, yeah, I, I thought it was a pretty decent performance. Definitely not our best. We've, as we mentioned, we've performed better and come away with nothing. So it's a different kind of result for us. But, yeah, it was needed. Uh, but Benny and Clolo definitely the star man at the moment for the Mariners. Yeah, for sure. And, Dean, what about you? I mean, we saw Dan Hall play it right back, and uh, he had a pretty busy game. And, and, and Nikolai Muller as well, who it's good to see, you know, a, a class player like him finally getting some regular first-team football and obviously finally getting his first goal. Are any of these guys standing out for you? Yeah, well, when I saw Dan Hall starting at right fullback, I automatically thought we might be playing a 3 5 two. Mm. I thought he was going to try play the three across Dan Hall, Tongyik and Rouse and maybe play Benny on one wing and Farrell on the other one. I thought he was going to go for that a bit in attack, but it just panned out to be a, the same old 4-4-2 four, 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 that we've been playing all year. You know, I think you hit it on the head in the, the post-game thing you did on the Mariners. Um, Dan Hall, the first half, he was nowhere to be seen attacking. Did everything defensive-wise defensive, defensive wise well, you know, for a right fullback. And then, yeah, the second half, he built a bit more, got a bit more attacking, and... Um, definitely showed and I thought yeah going with Ruan Tongyik yeah I, I don't know if anyone uh, a few fans saw what I, I put down on the, the thing yeah he just didn't look like he, he just didn't want to be there in the second half he was so off the pace you know the ball comes across yes it's just three or four blokes should have made the tackle out on the byline and Kai Rolls probably should have gone close to closing the, the player who crossed the ball in a bit more but um yeah, all he's got to do is header that over the over the crossbar and it's away for a corner, as you, you Cam said, you know, he just lost the man. And there was another one two minutes later where the ball got whipped across again and he just let it run past him. And it went past him, Birigetti and um, Storm Rue at the time. And that's when they had the close pen shield. They hit Rue on the hand, but, you know, it was against his body. But, yeah, yeah nah, Nicholas Muller, I think, yeah, as you said, more game time he gets, the better the better he's looking. I think um, Jason Cummings is just a step above everyone at the moment. You know, he's off the ball movement. He's his passes are just he's just trying to get the attack flowing quicker. Yeah, Marco Urena, I think, has been a little off the pass few weeks, but yeah, I, I think I've heard Maresh had a hamstring niggle on the weekend. That's the reason why he didn't feature. But yeah, no, I think yeah, Benny Ben Standy, I think. If you, the last time Cam was on the podcast, I was going with everything you guys said, you know, for me, he wasn't the highest, or, you know, he wasn't my first choice out of all the imports we have, you know, he would have been the last import I would have had starting, you know, I probably would have had Goddard, I think Goddard's quality, he's just at the moment, he's just unlucky, Benny's found some form and he's finding himself on the bench with no game time, so yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I feel for Goddard because his technical yeah. ability is insane. Left foot, right foot, his close control is is just a fantastic, tidy footballer. Phys- physically, he's probably not as strong as what we might require for the A-League, but certainly on the ball, he's fantastic. And I, I was surprised he didn't come on um, mm-hmm. in the second half because when you're trying to control possession and dictate the, the pace of the play, I think Goddard's a perfect person to sort of bring on in that situation because he is very good on the ball and it's also we sort of i know you've been talking a lot lucky about the different formations it's interesting watching maresh oh sorry not resh marco urenia cummings and muller they're sort yeah. of all sort of interchanging in the front three one will sort of drift wide a couple of them are drop back and cummings tends to be the man running off the running off the defense but the other two drop a bit deeper looking to get the ball to feed. It's almost like there's a, a rotating front three as opposed to a flat 4-4-2. Four, four, mm. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I noticed that for sure. I mean, there's so many times when Nicola Muller was was drifting very centrally and and, and it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a change. It was a change. Like, we didn't see that earlier on this season, you know, whether it was Cy Goddard or, or Nisbet playing out wide. Uh, yeah, we, there seemed to be that, that slight tactical change. Um, but it, it is exciting. And, and just some of the players, I mean, just thinking about the players that we have now in, in that front four, when Benny Colo, the, the man of form, and then three experienced players who, who have all shown 
that they can, you know, be top A-League players in Jason Cummings, Marco Renia, and Nicolai Muller. When I think of this this, this front four, I, I suddenly get very optimistic about our chances this season and and think that the more time these guys get together, like obviously the, the, those, those three experienced players have probably only played like, what, three or four weeks together now. I feel like with more game time and, and the combinations and rotating around that front line, there's a chance for Mariners to, to really score some goals, which have been lacking this season. We need to be scoring more goals. And, and, and speaking about our chances for the, for the in, in coming weeks in this season, I mean, we've got three tough games. We've got victory midweek on Wednesday. Uh, we're away to Perth Glory, big uh, long trip to, to WA. And then we play MacArthur in, in, in Mudgee, regional New South Wales. So, I mean, what do you guys make of our chances this season in terms of making a push to the top six? We're now seeing teams like Sydney FC and MacArthur maybe starting to slip slip away from the top six. Dean, if we want to start with you, do, like, do you think we can genuinely be looking and still be aiming for a top six finish? Yeah, I, I called it at the start of the year. I think, speaking to a few friends, I, I said if we finish fifth, sixth, seventh or eighth, I think I'd be happy with the squad we had at the start of the year. I think that was before we brought Cummings in. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going too much higher with the way our form's been over the past few weeks. I think fifth or sixth, if we scraped in there, I think I think we'd be a, a bogey side for certain teams in the finals. I think we could cause a bit of havoc if we scrape in. But yeah, I think it's just a bit, a bit of consistency we've got to find to, to be able to get there. Yeah, and what about you, Cam? I mean, compared to the other teams in the league and how teams' form is going, I know it's hard to predict, but can this Mariners squad currently, can we expect to finish top six? Uh, I don't know about expect, but we're certainly in with a chance. Um, I completely agreed with your analysis. Well, I was after the, the game last weekend where you said, I think the big thing, it can't go down to defense, you know, all these last minute goals, but mm. you know, a lot of them are just, you know, freak worldies or whether it's just, you know, just one tiny thing. You can't say that fence isn't up scratch because they've probably been some of our best and most consisting, consistent performers. Um, we're just not, capitalizing on our chances and with those four players up front that you mentioned if they can find form the mariners can definitely make a run and climb their way up the table i mean you know no team is unbeatable in this league that's what makes it so great um so I, I, they're definitely you know they're, they're a chance um but you know I'm, I'm hoping that the brisbane game gave them a lot of confidence that they can close out a game that they can score goals they can you know get the three points if we can get probably four points from the next few games i'd be pretty happy um a point against victory or macarthur and you know i'm hopeful of three against perth i know it's a bit of a trip but you know i thought last time we played them we it was one of our best performances and we deserved three points there. So I'm confident we can get three points against them again. And yeah, I mean, three wins would obviously be fantastic, but I think four points is a pretty realistic target for the squad. Yeah, I'd be happy with that too. Especially, I mean, especially considering how many points we dropped in recent weeks, it's important that we do start getting the points uh, ASAP as well. So we do stay in touch with the top six. Um, and speaking about some of these other teams, we'll run through some of the other big uh, results from the weekend and some of the big stories. And, I mean, Friday night, we saw Melbourne Victory defeat MacArthur FC 3-1. I watched this game, and, and it was a dominant performance from Melbourne Victory. They could have won this one like 5 or 6 nil. Um, D'Agostino bagged a, a double. Um, Dean, if we want to start off with you, Melbourne Victory, do you still think they're a chance to win the title this season? What do you think? Yeah, definitely. You know, their, their squad depth's ridiculous. I think it showed on Friday night how good of a side they are. You know, MacArthur started the season so strong, and... I think victory definitely showed on Friday night MacArthur's weak points, you know. The, just the first goal was just a quick press, you know. They pressed um, and caused the, the turnover of Tommy Orr being too too deep and too square. And Doug Stanner goes through, nice nice finish. And then the second goal, you know, it's a keeper error, falls to Doug Stanner's feet, you know, right place at the right time. And then their third goal is just, you know, that's, that's what you want to see in football, you know. Berlante plays in the, you know, D'Agostino. D'Agostino with a nice back heel square across and Roas has his first goal of the season. You know, I think it's, yeah, they're definitely t title contenders. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And looking at the other fixture as well that we had that we had on Saturday as well, we'll talk about West United Jets. And Western United, they picked up their, their third, uh, sorry, their fourth consecutive win. And it's now their, it's their 10th win, I think, now of the season. 
they're, they're just there's no, they're showing no signs of slowing down. Cam, what do you make of West United this season? Like, are, are they for me? I think they're now absolutely favourites to take out at least the Premier's plate. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, and even the Championship too. I mean, they say you know, whereas it goals win games, but defence wins championships and titles and you know how many one nil two nil results of western united had this season i mean you know credit to john aloisi i mean a lot of people didn't want to give him any credit at the start of the season but he's you know he's come in and he's done a fantastic job with that squad um compared to where they were last year i mean they've come absolute leaps and bounds and yeah i mean there's no reason why they can't go on for me they're the favorites to win the premier's plate as well we know finals is a completely different ball game but they're they're certainly a team in tremendous form. They they work as a unit, which I think is perhaps the most vital point. I mean, you have to when you're so defensive in the way that they are. Um, so, yeah, I I think they're probably shoo-in for Premier's Plate. Absolutely, yeah. And it was in this game that Leela Kwa, the centre-back, scored a double from from from, from the centre-back uh, position. And I saw, I can't remember who it was, and, I, and I've got to credit them. I think it was someone on Twitter mentioned it, like compared uh, Leela Kwa to, he's like the A-League uh, Virgil van Dijk. And it's so true. He's just a B centre-back. He's absolutely bossing it every single week. And uh, fantastic to have a play of his quality in the league. But the big Saturday night fixture, it was the Sydney derby. West of Sydney Wanderers 2, Sydney FC nil. And I, I made a specific video touching on Sydney FC on the weekend because I had to talk about, like, it's, it's quite dramatic seeing how they're really struggling at the moment, Sydney FC. Three consecutive losses on the verge. Well, basically, will slip out of the top uh, the top six. Wellington Phoenix, who just sit behind them, have four games in hand on them. It, it, as, as, a Mariners, as Mariners fans, I, I, I'm sure it brings you guys joy to see Sydney FC uh, <laughs> struggling just a little bit. Dean, what do you make of Sydney FC and how they're going at the moment? Well, you just you said it then, three losses <laughs> on a trot, and that's three starts that Andrew Remes had since coming back from the Socceroos. Simple as, you know. Um, Stuart Bell was was playing some pretty good footy in goals. Yeah. Well, I'm not, that's going to win them games. Yes, we get that. But he he wasn't causing as many errors as what I'd say Red May is. You know, the first in the first 20 minutes, well, what I saw the highlights of it today, you know, he spilt four or five balls and nearly caused, you know, goals for Western Sydney. You know, I think I think it's time to get some change. Yes, he's been well for them over the past how many years, but I think that a bit of change, I think the age age factor, you and I spoke about that the last time I was on the pod, the age factor for Sydney FC is really starting to catch up with them now. You know, Sydney mm-hmm. FC or Western Sydney, sorry, just played with a bit of pace there on the weekend and you know, the first 25 minutes, it was all Western Sydney, you know. They just caused caused issues for the back six, I'd say, for Sydney FC, and they had nothing about it. They've got no depth because they've never needed to change their squad. That's the thing. All the young kids they have now playing at right and left fullback when, you know, Ryan Grant's out or the two they have playing left fullback now is, what, Connor O'Toole and... Uh, Chris Talbot as well, yeah. Talbot, you know, both... Yes, O'Toole's had some experience in the A-League, but he's not really up to the Sydney FC standard. So they're finally finally getting found out. And, you know, is Corica that good of a coach now? Let's see if he can get them out, if he can get them out of the slump. You know, he, at the moment, he's had the players to have a squad to go win championships because it, no one's found problems with them. And now mm. every side's breaking them down and they're not getting results. If you yeah. want to go with Steve Corica, don't at Sydney FC on Twitter. <laughs> Did I see that? No, no what are you talking about? Oh, someone just said that Corrick is past it and, you know, he's a rubbish coach. And the actual Sydney FC Twitter account came back and said, you know, it's a tough thing to rebuild after, you know, one manager has so much success. Look at Man United and Sarah Alex Ferguson. And, you know, when you have all the players like Bobo and all the, you know, star players for them depart, you know, they, you know, really defended him on Twitter, which was. Quite funny because you normally don't see a club bite back at people on Twitter like that. Wow! Yeah, wow, that's, that is interesting. Um, and 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 look, when we look at West City Wanderers as well, we should touch on them and credit to them too for getting the victory. Um, the, man, a funny team, and and some, like some games actually look pretty decent, but you know the next week they'll fall apart. Uh, Cam, what, what's your assessment on West City Wanderers so far this season? Mark Rodin's come in for, and he's been there for the last month or so. Yeah, they've already given him a, a contract. They've, yeah. they've locked him down for the next three years, which is surprising. Um, but uh, like, are, 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 yeah, yeah. Are they are they in contention to 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 be a top six side, or, or are you just going to write them off this season? Well, if I have a Sydney Dolphins every week, they might be all right. 
Because they, yeah. they all, it's the you know the classic you know the early up for the derby and then the rest of the season they sort of fall off. But it as Dean mentioned, they just played so much quicker than Sydney FC, and I think it's that's the style of play which you know can probably bring them success because they do have a lot of speed in their attack and some quality in there as well. Um, it's a huge result for Rudin. I mean, as we mentioned, you know he got given the gig full time before the Sydney derby, and that could have blown up in their face tremendously. Like if they got thumped four 0 they're going to look real silly, but it could have been 4 0 to Wanderers. They, Abini had a chance as well. So when they were 2 0 up, could have, you know, further cemented it. Um, you know, it, and it's also interesting that when you slide tackle outside the box and it carries through into the box, oh. that it's actually a free kick. Who'd have thought? And, and, just, and just how quick it took too. Like uh, the, the VAR stepped in and said, yep, it's outside the box. And it took, it maybe took like less than 20 seconds and it was done. And it was um, nowhere near as conclusive as oh, the incident with the Mariners. And exactly. VAR just said to Alex King, yeah, but it's outside the box. He didn't even get caught over to the screen. Mm. It, 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 it really is. <laughs> and, and like, I know it's been like a few weeks now. I think it's been like what, two or three weeks now, but oh, it's, it's not it's over. It. Yeah, dude. Oh, I mean, it's, uh, again, it's, I, I, it's one of the worst decisions. Yeah. It's definitely too easy to target Sean Evans still. Like, you know, you know I saw the... Um, the Mares won this morning in the Manchester derby, and they they scored off it. You know, hit his hand blatantly, and you know, I just said to my mate, "Oh, Sean Evans must have been the referee for that game." Play on. <laughs> you know, he'll find any excuse to to get the game flowing and and play on with a ten minute break. So, you know. yeah, yeah, that's right. And and I know we, I mean, we hate seeing refereeing blunders, but it it does somewhat give me peace seeing that it's happening in other league, like in, in somewhere like the Premier League. Like, it's not necessarily yeah. just the A-League where it's happening. There's been some blunders in the Premier League this season as well. That Rodri won last week. Oh, the handball? Dude, oh. it was blatant. It was so clear. <laughs> Any, anyway, we could be literally all day talking about referees. And, yeah. you know, Dean and I, we used to be referees locally here on the coast. So, like, we know what it's like to get abused and we know what it's like to have people seeing the game differently to how you see it. But... It, it appears with some of these instances that it is literally the referee sees it and the rest of the world sees it a very different way. And you just have to, you know, you just, it just baffled sometimes how they come up with some of these decisions. I mean, what did you make of the Donicky penalty? Uh, I, I, I think it's, I think it's hard to say no penalty. I mean, I mean, yes, it's, it's pretty light, but he, he brings the player down. There's enough contact at like if 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 that was you know Mariners play that go that goes I'm, I'm screaming penalty all day. So hmm. look, I understand when people are saying it's light, but I, I think you have to give a penalty for that if there isn't that that much contact. I mean, he got nutmegged in the box. You know, as as a defender myself, if I'm getting nutmegged and he's trying to drag a leg across me, there's 99 percent chance that you're going to make contact. As Lockie just said, it was soft, but it's a penalty. Yeah, I think, I think... FC, just blow it. It's a penalty. Sydney FC yeah. is giving it away. We love to see it. Give the penalty. Yeah, I think he made the most of the contact, but he dangled yeah. the leg. And as a defender, you're always running the risk by doing that. So, yeah, yeah. I was comfortable with that penalty. I just couldn't believe my eyes when they overturned the other penalty. Yeah. Rich mm. and Grant. <laughs> it, it, it's weird that they didn't even ask him to go over to the monitor all because it was quite close. It was like almost just in the line. So, yeah. Anyway. Bit of a, it's a crazy time in, in the A-League. And the final game we saw this weekend was Adelaide 2, Perth Glory 1. And, and an important three points for Adelaide. And Perth Glory, I don't know about you guys, if you've been watching much Perth Glory this season, but they're just so boring to watch. They've got Bruno <laughs> Fornaroli in attack. And it looks like that that's all they've got going for him. Unfortunately, Daniel Sturridge is still injured. And, and I guess the question we have to ask now, I mean, as we're approaching the midway point of the season, is uh, can, are we labeling Daniel Sturridge a flop already? I mean, is he going to come back anytime soon? What do you guys make of this, Dean? Even start off with you. Yeah, I haven't watched much of Perth. As you said, they're boring. So it's definitely <laughs> one that if I want to fall asleep, I'll watch them play. Their games are that late at night, they can put you to sleep. So, um, yeah, they're nothing special. <laughs> you know, I'd, they've got no standout players. Like, yeah, they've got four in a rolly, but really, he's not been that exciting this year. I don't know if that's because he's not getting the service that he's had the previous few years, you know, with Castro in behind him, he's scoring all the goals and, you know, perfect looking good, but yet yeah, it's just got nothing, nothing anymore. You know, they're just grinding out results. Mm. You can say if they get a point or three points, it's a grind to get it. You know, the only real convincing three points I've seen them get this year is when they beat Melbourne Victory back at the start of the year in Amy Park. You know, I think that was the only real game I've seen them 
outplay a team and and earn points, you know. It's, it's just, yeah, boring football to watch. Yeah, and from a Mariners' point of view, it's also funny. I mean, on on the weekend they had Jack on the on the wings they had Jack Clisby. Jack Clisby's been like one of their main attacking players this season, and Nick Fitzgerald, who I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but I never really like. He was promising in the early days, but I never really rated Nick Fitzgerald for the Mariners. It's uh, it's funny seeing these guys now, <laughs> now Perth Glory, and they being utilised as these key attacking players. Hey? Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't forget the toll that has been taken on Perth Glory off oh, the true. football pitch. I mean, you know, the the whole WA hard border and, okay, we're in Brisbane. Oh, hang on. No, we're coming back to play some home games. Oh, no, the border's been reinstated. You know, being away from family for that long has to take a toll on the mentality of the players. Um, but, you know, you, I, I honestly expected them to do better. I mean, even without storage, I mean, I thought Brandon O'Neill was a fantastic signing for them. Um, I thought he was going to make a world of difference, but, yeah, I don't know. They've I don't know whether they hedged all their bets on a play style around Sturridge. I can't imagine they would have because of his injury concerns. But yeah, they've just seemed uh, even with if Sturridge was playing, I I struggle to see how they get the results that they need. Um, and it just makes it all that more frustrating that we couldn't beat them the other week because mm. they never. I mean, they as you, uh, Dean mentioned, you know, they sort of grind out results, but. You know, you, you expect a team like the Mariners with the quality that they have in the attacking third to be able to to punish them and to finish them off, and hopefully they can when we play them in Perth on the weekend. Hopefully, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, and of course, as always, so much A League action coming up. We've got we've got, we've got like at least three midweek games every single week, and it, and it's not going to stop, I'm sure, uh, throughout uh, the next uh, the coming weeks and coming months of the A League season. Guys, thanks so much for jumping on the podcast this week. I appreciate it. And if you're listening, don't forget that these podcast episodes drop every single Tuesday on all podcast platforms and on the YouTube channel. Uh, we'll see you guys in the next one.